Thank you. Lovely to be here uh, to chat with you today in this beautiful room. I'd like to give, try and live sort of within 10 minutes, which is impossible, to give you a quick <laughs> overview of uh, the developments really in income inequality, how we measure this broadly. I want to uh, focus on income inequality. So the first thing to note is this is not wealth inequality. It's not consumption inequality. These all matter. They're all different polarization inequalities in time. But the main look that's, that, that's prompted the debate is income inequality. These are the numbers that we've seen going up. So I'll bar largely be talking about that and market, large concepts of market after tax income and that. Now, the first, when I say uh, how we measure income inequality, we, we use a bunch of measures, either concentration measures, shares going to the top percent, or we use Gini coefficients, we use low income lines, we use a mix of measures. And each of these measures will have subtle differences. So I think the bottom line to go quickly is you need to look at multiple measures uh, on this slide. So I'm going to take you through a few multiple measures. All these slides, I'm going really fast, but they're all up on a website uh, somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where it is, but Julie will. <laughs> exactly. Or you can email me. So the first is a rather standard picture a lot of you may have seen. It's the growth in the shares of income going to the top 20% of Canadians, so the top quintile. You can see there was a sharp buildup in the 1990s, so it was sort of level in there in the, in the 80s while it was rising in the States, sharp buildup in the 90s, and pretty well level since around 2000 or so, the shares to the top 20%. That's based on survey data, it's the SLID data you usually see, and that's why we only go with the top 20%. You can't use the SLID to look at the top 1%. Um, the average incomes underlying these lines are also rising, but more so at the top. So this just lets you know quickly that the, uh, the growth in average incomes for the highest quintile were about 32% compared to about 8%. So everyone growing, but the top growing faster in terms of average incomes. Now, the 20% I showed in these average incomes, they're not really what's driving the recent trend in, in, in the old... 80s, way back then, it was sort of a rust belt issue was driving the inequality. Uh, the cities were bottoming out in the states and, and there was middle level. Now we're seeing growth at the high end. That 20% growth, I should point out, only the top 5% grew. The 80th to the 95th percentile actually lost shares. So when you're looking at the, the top 20, that shows it going up, 15 of those top 20 weren't rising. It was the top five. And of the top five, most of the actions in the top one. So maybe of 6% growth at some period, one point, about 5% five, five of that was all top one. So this is really top one. And this is the top one graph. So it looks similar-ish, only you can see there's a small curve or downturn around the uh, tech bust in around 2000, and then there was a buildup and another drop uh, around the Great Recession. So, and there was another interesting thing. This particular line, if you've read your Globe and Mail this morning, this line is low, according to research in the Globe and Mail. If we take the incomes that owners of corporations retain in their corporations and allocate that back to the owners, we find about a 2-3% rise or a 25% rise in the shares going here. And not only that, that gap has been widening in the last 10 years. So there's a lot of new research out and we're starting to bring in the, the corporation stuff. There are other dimensions to the top one. We've uh, found that the top one, this surge that occurred during that time was primarily responsible or happened in Toronto and Calgary. So, so over 50% uh, of the shares of that growth occurred in Toronto and Calgary and over 80% occurred in the top six cities. So the growth is really an urban phenomenon and, and more importantly in the Toronto growth that occurred in 82 to 95 it was the biggest but since 95 Calgary has been the largest source of the growth in income inequality. So you start to get a sense that inequalities following economic growth a little bit here. We see little turn ups in St. John's and things like that for the, the oil boom. Uh, some small evidence for this is a suggestive, not conclusive, uh, is when I look at Calgary in the top 
in the wage shares going to the top 5% by industry, we can see it isn't just the oil industry or the big industries in Calgary. You'll see that little blue bar occurs across a number of industries, suggesting that where that economic growth is occurring in Calgary, it's actually having effects even in industries like utilities, etc. Now I'm going to move you back to the top one. This graph comes from Sayez and Veal. It's a little bit longer in time span. So the growth I showed you in the first graph that goes up to the, uh, from the 80s upward, we can see here that the, the shares were as high back in the 40s. But after the, uh, <clears throat> they, they dropped sharply into the middle and just started coming back again. You see the blue line is rising as well as the red, that's Canada, US. The little jump in the blue line is kind of interesting. That happens because in America, it, they changed the rules so that it was beneficial to report your income, not through your S corporation, but individually. So there was more income that actually came that we were measured. So maybe when we add our corporate lines in here, we can make these comparable. But little wiggles in the line often have policy, uh, policy rules behind them. Now, this, this surge that is occurring largely in Anglo-Saxon countries, uh, UK, Canada, US, doesn't occur in all countries. So just to show you here, Japan, Italy, and France, the resurge did not occur uh, in these countries. So now I'll move from the shares, which was really the driving story in the, in the most recent uh, interest in income inequality, and look at the genies. This is international genies. Uh, Canada, you can see, well, maybe you can't. I don't know how <laughs> easy it is to read back there. But Canada is sort of in the middle, just uh, closer to the top end of the pack, both in terms of its, its genie coefficient and in terms of its growth in genie. Um, in the Canada provinces, same story occurring. You can see that's where the little blue bars, the old year, and the top the little blue box is the old one, and the top of the bar is the recent. So increases everywhere except for PEI, highest levels in Ontario, Alberta, and BC, uh, and the Canadian thing. These are our Gini coefficients, family income inequality. Now, the tax and transfer system does affect uh, and can help to reduce inequality. Uh, I'll draw a small distinction between redistribution, I'll show you in a minute, is the amount by which the genie is reduced, or is progressivity is really how far from proportionality uh, are we looking? So the first picture has two lines on it. The top line is the uh, market income inequality, and the bottom line is the after tax. So pre-government, post-government. A couple big things to notice here. The flatness of the line post-government, the after tax line all the way up to the middle of the graph, which is about the 90, is flat whereas market income inequality was increasing. So the tax and transfer system was able to come in and compensate for increases in market income inequality. That did not quite as ha much happen through the 90s. So the market income inequality encroached, but the, 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 after, the tax transfer system didn't compensate for all of it. A fair amount of it, as you can see, but not all of it. So the line rose up, and then we're sort of level after that. Um, when I break these down to specific programs, this looks at the reduction in the Gini coefficient caused by adding this transfer to income. That's what you're looking at here. And the top line is OASGIS. So it's a pretty big program, billions, 15 billion plus dollars, and it, it makes a fair distance. A difference in the Gini coefficients is also very well targeted to seniors. Um, the CPP, QPP, another senior one, you can see the red line starts screaming up as CPP matures and then settles up at, uh, at its maturation level. And there's a rise up of the child benefits of children. So uh, that one has become more redistributive over time. Other than redistribution, sort of the size of the average amount of the program, we can look at progressivity. And the progressivity tends to uh, be fairly stable over time and is highest for things like social assistance. And it's highest because it's very targeted. Social assistance uh, goes right to the people in need and has the highest uh, difference from proportionality. But OASGIS follows. And again, an e UI, EI is on the bottom. But the uh, child benefits line, again, is increasing because we've targeted and pushed down the scale. That has gone up. 
So taxes and transfers really can move the system. Um, low income trends, I guess before we saw a lot of in inequality trends, we're used to looking at a lot of low income trends, either using the low income cutoff or using the low income measure. Low income cutoff being an absolute measure, limb being a relative measure. The difference I want to point out here is that the absolute measure, the LICO, you can see that sharp fall in the red line is all because we're, we're low income is uh, becoming less on a relative absolute standard, 1992 fixed income, because wages are growing faster than prices and we're only in indexing this line by prices. When I look at people in a relative way, what, what is the actual distribution of that year? That's the blue line and it's fairly flat. Uh, it matters for policy in certain ways. When you look at seniors, the line continues to fall for seniors under absolute, but in the last decade, it started to come up a bit, meaning perhaps the seniors aren't keeping pace with the growth in median incomes. So a combination, again, multiple indicators tell us more than one indicator. It makes it a little harder for conclusive findings, but, but is it a better way of looking at it? The last thing I wanted to look at that's part of the story is mobility. It's, it's a big thing in the states where they say, well, we're, we're okay with a lot of inequality because everyone can just jump to the top and, and, and there's up and down mobility. So, so mobility is a part of the debate. Um, so we look at exit rates from low income and a little bit of mobility. Like, I'll just jump to the grass. Way more interesting. So this, the point to be made here is that about 30% of people exit low income every year. So of people in there, you're getting a third of them are moving out. There's a fair turnover. Uh, an even smaller portion are long term, over six years, five years. So a lot of income mobility dropping in and out of low income. But in general, we find that income mobility is actually decreasing a little bit over time. So Beach and Bradbury and Jay and, and ourselves have found uh, fewer people exiting or moving out of the top decile. So more people are staying in the top one. We've got some numbers there. More people slightly staying in the bottom end, less, less mobility. However, relative to other countries, we're still much better off than the states in terms of intergenerational mobility. So this is where we try and relate the earnings of sons to that of their fathers. And we find if you're gonna earn the same as your father, well then that's gonna be not much mobility. And these graphs are really just making the point that uh, there's more intergenerational income mobility in Canada than there is in the States. So we're not quite the same in the States. Um, so in a whirlwind tour, um, <laughs> give you a few con conclusions. Slightly over, two minutes, but uh, so I can't read these things. Maybe you can read them to me. But inequality, income inequality has risen in Canada. Uh, we know those. And <clears throat> sharp increase in the 90s. And underlying the rise was an increase in family income inequality that came in the, in the 1990s. Um, oh yeah, the LICO, the LICO point I made in, in previous years, um, there's a lot of mobility and mobility is higher than the states. Uh, it just summarized everything I said. Income <laughs> mobility was in there. So I've already covered that. And thank you very much for listening.